In this video, we're going to pick up where we left off, where we had set up our Firebase so that we could import the movies collection and then use it to say, like, grab all of the movies that are in our collection. So that's what we did last time. Um, this time we are going to start adding that into our React application. So we'll take a quick tour of the starter files here, and then we will start building out first that read operation where we do essentially this um, and get everything from our collection here. So let me uncomment that, get rid of our load sample data. We don't want this running every time. Um, here we go. We can see all of those movies are being printed out here. So we just don't want to print them out to the console. We want to print them out in a component. So let's comment this out again. And to start with, let's take a quick tour of the project. So we saw last time that we had this data folder that had everything related to our database. So let me collapse that. Um, we are in our index.js here, which loads the app component. So if we want to trace the logic here, the next stop would be the app component. And we can also see that this loads in some basic CSS for the page. So it changes the font, um, changes the font size, the color, the box sizing, and also sets up our body to have a background color and a max width here. Okay, so CSS aside, we can see if we go into our components, we've got a lot of components here, but we're gonna trace them one at a time so it won't be incredibly overwhelming. Um, so we're starting at app, which if we take a glance at our app here, we have a nav component that's being loaded inside of a browser router. And then we have a switch here, which is um, what we saw with React Router, is how we can wrap a bunch of routes to ensure that only one of them gets loaded to the page. So uh, the switch enforces that with each route, only one of them loads, and then each route here is configured with a path. So here, this first route is saying the home page, and we're, we're specifying exact to mean that only the path that starts with the slash and nothing else. And if we were to leave this off, um, this actually matches anything after the slash. So we would never be able to go to slash add slash edit without this exact here. So this loads our movies page, which we can see up here is coming from pages movies page. We also have a slash add route, which goes to the add movie page, which is imported up here. And we have this um, route here for edit with this funky syntax with an ID, which eventually is gonna mean that we can go to any route um, using that like key from our database. So we could go to edit slash three Q Y F O E all this, um, all the rest of these characters which would load up this uh, Logan movie data into our application and allow us to edit it. And if we went to instead uh, edit slash E-N-Z-T-Q blah 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 here, that would load the witches into our application. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it, but you know the idea is just that we have slash edit plus some information that loads the edit movie page. And then we have something new here, which is a catch-all and a 404 page. So if someone tries to go to something that is not slash, slash add, or slash edit, we will end up at this not found page, which is also imported from pages not found page. So we've got a high level preview of what the app does. And then what we would do is dig into any of the, these components that we want to know about. So for instance, if we want to know about nav, we can see, ah, that is just imported from the components folder and the file called nav. And this is a nav element with links that take us to those different pages. So one to take us to the home page, one to take us to the add page. And this uses BEM styling conventions where we have the um, block called nav, and then we have elements within that block, uh, nav under underscore link. And if we look at the CSS, it follows those conventions. Okay, so our nav is pretty easy. It, it just sets up this structure where we can go between the pages. And now we could start digging into some of those pages. So let's ignore for the moment the add movie page and the edit movie page. And we're just gonna focus on that movies page. So this home page, which should load all of the movies. So let's take a look at the movies page. If we look at the pages folder and then movies page, 
we have a main element and inside of that is a helmet element that uh, sets the title of the page and then it loads a movie listing component. So this helmet stuff was an extra credit from Code Sprint A, so it's an optional video. So a quick explanation is that what this allows us to do is use this library, React Helmet, to change the title uh, of our page dynamically. So normally the title is something that you would set um, in your index.html here, like in the head tag. But when we're working in React, we are putting elements on the page, we're not modifying the head tag. So if we want to modify the head tag, um, we can use React Helmet to replace this title that's in here. So if we look, uh, when I click on all movies, the title changes up here in the title bar and add movie changes to add. So some of the structure that I like to use in projects is that when we have pages and we're doing this like stuff, like setting up the helmet, um, I'm going to do that in the pages folder here where I'm setting up components that import helmet and set the title. So my add movie page sets the title to add, edit sets it to edit, movies page sets it to movies, um, our 404 changes it to not found, and loads a paragraph tag. Actually, we didn't see this when we were looking at the app, but let's try that. So if I type in a bunch of gibberish, we end up at no no pa such page exists. And you could go ahead and you know improve the style here, but that's a, a basic way to set up a 404. Let's go back to the main page. Um, so I, I like to set up my page level components to handle setting up the title. And then these page components, try and keep them trim, like our movies page here. And all of the um, work of actually rendering things to the page happens in the movie listing component. So this allows us to kind of separate our concerns so that our movie listing component can just focus on rendering movies to the page and doesn't have to think about, you know, setting up the helmet. Okay, so we've got our movies page, which loads our movie listing component, which we can see is in components movie listing. So let's go in there to movie listing.js. And this has a skeleton of a component set up for us, which has a spot to store an array of movies, and it has um, a piece of state for whether or not this page is loading, and it has a piece of state associated with whether or not there's an error on this page. And all of this matters because when we did our whiteboard before, we noticed that when we load the page, we'll have to have a little loading spinner. And when we get data, we will have to do one thing. So we need a place to store that data. And if we have an error, we kind of need a place to store that error because we're going to display that to the page. So this component is already set up with a loading spinner. So whenever this is loading state is true, this loading spinner gets displayed. So if I were to force this to be true by changing the initial value of the state and look at it in the browser, we've got this loading spinner running. And this loading spinner, we had in the starter files last time. I just modified it a little bit for our purposes this time. So it has a couple of extra props that it accepts. We had size, where you could specify how big that was, that was configured um, in our last project. Um, and this time, we now have a color that you can set for that spinner color. So you can put any CSS color, and that'll change that interior spinner and then the background color here. You can put any CSS color in there and that will change the background behind the spinner. If you're curious about how that's set up, you can look in the component here, which accepts a series of props, size, spinner color, background color, and what it does is apply a default value here. So in our object destructuring, we can destructure without specifying default values and that'll look like we've written before but if you put an equal sign after any of these and specify a value that sets it up so that if no size was provided 10 rem will be used and if no spinner color is provided this color will be used and no background color is provided this color will be used so very similar to our loading spinner as last time just a few extra configuration things um, to make it a little bit more flexible and usable we go back to our movie listing that's our loading spinner 
And we have our error message um, from last time too. So let me get rid of our loading spinner. I'm gonna set the state back to false. So we shouldn't see it. And then let's say there was an error. So I'm gonna just mock it up by saying like error, connect to database. We have a slight modification to our error component to allow it to show up as a card on the page so that it's readable on this dark background. So same deal, if you're curious about that, you can dig into the error message component, which has a few extra configuration um, options. So the props it accepts are up here. Um, so it takes a Boolean display as props or to display as card prop. So if you pass in true, this will display it with that card background. If you um, leave that as false, it will display it without. So if we go back to movie listing and this, we remove this prop and save it, it will display it without that background. So this will be make it, uh, this will make this component more useful so that we can use it on pages where we want to display an error at the top in a card and pages where we actually want to display an error within like say a form here. Okay, let me get rid of that error message and let's get cracking here. So we've got things back to the default state where what we wanna do is run this logic that um, we were doing here where we ran an async function, talked to the movies collection, tried to grab all of the docs and then use those docs. Um, but we wanna do that inside of our movie listing component. The added wrinkle here is that we don't actually just wanna do the fetching right here. So we don't wanna do the fetching every time this component is rendered um, because that's actually going to fetch um, a bunch of times uh, unnecessarily. So pretend for a minute that this logic that we've got here is actually all of this logic um, where we ran our async function to get all of the movies. And if we look at our movie listing um, in the browser here, every time we see the word fetching means that we would have gone to talk to the database and pull new data. And if I flip into my components panel, go to my movie listing here, and I start, uh, let me make sure that I I have my console window open at the bottom when I'm on my components page. Um, so I'm hitting escape to toggle my console window open on this page. So anytime I change my state, a new fetch would start. So when the loading flips to true, when it flips back to false, our fetching would run again and again. And actually this would lead to infinite fetching um, because presumably our fetch, when we start it, would need to change the state to say that now it's time to load and display that loading spinner. So it would be very bad for us to do that fetching here. What we actually want to express is like, <laughs> we, we kind of want to tell React, like, you know, only fetch when this component is loaded on the page for the first time, because that's the time when we need to go talk to the database and pull things down. But don't you know, refetch every time the state changes. And that's where I have a couple of links here for a new hook that we're going to use. So the first link here is the use effect hook reference um, or guide. And the next one is the API reference. So I'm going to hold alt, pop both of these open in the browser so that we can take a quick look. And um, the use effect hook here, it's telling us it allows us to perform a side effect in function components. And if we look down here, it's telling us things like data fetching, setting up a subscription, manually changing the DOM. Those are all examples of side effects. So these are things that don't involve us like returning something different to tell React to render something. Um, it involves us doing some kind of side effect that is not related to directly to this rendering. And you can see an example here. So this is a example that changes the title of the document um, every time this button is clicked. So the way use effect is being run here is that uh, when this component renders, it sets up a count. So it has some state here. 
it puts that on the page. So you clicked however many times and it sets up a button that goes ahead and increments that count by one. So if you load the page, it would say you clicked zero times. Every time we click, that would go up. So click three times, we would see you clicked three times. Um, this use effect runs after the page has been rendered. So after you know this has been rendered the first time, we get the title being changed in the um, title of the tab. Um, and the way the use effect here is being used is that every time this is re-rendered, the effect runs um, fresh. But with use effect and a slight modification, we can get it to set up uh, to run um, only when the component is put onto the page for the first time. So I recommend reading through, pausing here and reading through this page um, so that you make sure that you understand use effect before bringing it into your projects. And they have a, a few examples that are pretty helpful for recapping the different usages of use effect. And then the hooks API reference is um, a more technical explanation of use effect. And it says that use effect accepts a function that uh, contains imperative, possibly effectful code. So this, this is meaning, you know, these are our side effects that you don't want to do during the rendering of the component, but you want to set up to run um, at some point in the life cycle of your component. Like for instance, us, we want to set up something to run when the component renders for the first time, but not every time it renders. So let me show you some of this in our code. Uh, we are going to use effect and here I'm going to hit tab on this to auto import use effect and put an arrow function in it. And actually, if I look up here, oh, I don't love what it did. <laughs> so uh, it actually added a second import here from React and I would like to keep all of mine nice and tidy. So I'm going to fix this and type in use effect up here. So I'm bringing in both use state and use effect. And this version of use effect is actually going to function the same way as our previous logic. Uh, it, it has a subtle difference, but we'll, we won't be too worried about that subtle difference. Um, here, console.log, if I pop open my console, it runs when our component renders for the first time. And also runs anytime the state changes. So fetching ran again. The difference, the subtle difference is that, you know, this actually happens after all of our component has been rendered. Um, so it doesn't block any of the component from being rendered. You know, if this were a really expensive operation, it wouldn't lock up that rendering thread. Um, but we can make a small modification to our use effect here that will make it so that it only runs when the component actually mounts or is displayed. And that is using the second parameter here to use effect. So we pass in a function and then we pass in um, dependencies. So if we look at the documentation page here and scroll down, here is our sort of documentation on how to conditionally fire an effect. Um, and it's telling us the default behavior is effects should fire after every render, but if you take our second parameter here and pass in some specific variables, it tracks those and will only run this effect when those variables have changed. And if you specify no variables, what that means is only run this effect when the component is loaded for the first time on the page. So if I check it out now, refresh, to load my page, I can see fetching here. And then if I were to simulate the state changing, like let's go into loading, no fetching again shows up. So we have effectively, with our use effect hook, set this up so that we can only, we, we run this only when the component mounts for the first time. And later we'll see, you know, we, we will want some pages where we actually put something in here as the dependency of use effect like you know if you put is loading in here anytime is loading changes your effect will rerun which doesn't make sense in the context of this page but will make sense in the context of other pages so let's add a little note here 
use effect allows us to run side effects after rendering and passing in an empty array for the second parameter allows us to run the effect conditionally and only whoops and only when the component mounts for the to the page so mounting here it's another way of saying like the first render so the first time you go to this component and with that we have this component set up so that it's actually going to be really easy we've already written the code for talking to our database if i go back to my index.js this um, will be able to bring over this get all movies function and just modify it to set it up um, inside of our effect so i'm going to cut this and get rid of the import here for movies collection movie yeah movies collection that's gone we can leave sample data and then go to our movie listing and paste this in for reference inside of our use effect and then we need to make sure that we import movies collection so if i go to the end hit control space to pop up the intellisense completions i can see that this is telling me to, that it will auto import so i could click on that bring that in or i could just write out this manually importing from data firebase so I tend to like to organize my imports so that my external dependencies are first, then any of my JS dependencies, and then my CSS. So I was just bubbling this to move this up a line. So if we save this, this actually should work. So this should fetch when our component loads, and we should see all of those docs print out. Um, so here's all that information printing out, and what we want to do is actually hook this up to the page to show these in our unordered list. So it's helpful to review um, what's going on here before we actually move forward, just to make sure that we, we have a rock solid understanding of Firebase. So inside of Firebase, you're, you're often going to be talking to either a document reference or a collection reference. And movies collection, if I fly over to my Firebase file, we saw that that is talking to our database and pulling our movies collection. So this gives us a reference to our movies collection. And then as we saw in our um, read data page for getting data, and we went over here to get all documents in a collection. If you have that collection reference, you call .get, it gives you back a promise that turns into a snapshot of all of the, uh, of that collection. And it's also helpful, I'm gonna pull up the API reference and go to the web version. So I'm gonna, Hop that over to a new tab. And this is our technical reference for um, all of the classes and objects that are involved in the Firebase library. So if we want to see what db.collection gives us, what we look at is our Firestore and look at the collection method. And that tells us it returns so when you call collection and you pass in the path as a string, it returns a collection reference that points to document data. So if I click on collection reference, I can see what is involved in this um, object that we've got. So with a collection reference, we can call .add to put something new in there. We can call .doc to get a reference to a specific doc. And we can also call .get to um, get a snapshot of everything that's in there. So .get, we can see that there are options that we can pass in, and the question mark here means that those are optional. And if we look at our code, here's our collection reference. .get, we didn't pass anything in there that we could have. Um, this returns a promise that resolves to uh, whatever's in the um, less than greater than sign here, a query snapshot. 
uh, or a query snapshot. So this promise gives us back a query snapshot. So this side of the equation is a promise. When we await it, we get what it resolves to here. So we've got a snapshot. And with a snapshot in hand, we can see, you know, is that snapshot empty? What's the size of the snapshot? We can run a for each on that snapshot to loop over all of the documents, or we can call the docs property, which gives us back an array of uh, query document snapshots. So that's what we're doing here, where we have our uh, array of all of the documents, which allowed us to loop over them. And we were able to, for instance, read the ID of the document and read the data of the document. So again, we kind of have to hop around the documentation here. We know that we've got an array. So when we're looping over it, each element is a query document snapshot. And so that allowed us to read the ID um, and allowed us to call the data method, which what that does is retrieve all of the methods in the document as an object. So we're going to need to do these, um, this ID and pull the data, but we don't really want to do it here. We, we want to pull that data and use it down here in our unordered list. So what we want to do is instead of printing this out here, we actually want to start hooking up this component to our state. So this is going to be really simpler, symbol, um, similar to the Pokemon API. That how we interacted with it in React, where when our application starts the fetch, we tell our state that we are loading. When it finishes the fetch, we can go ahead and say we are no longer loading. And then um, when we actually have some data back, we can put that into our movies state here. So we can say set movies to our docs. And then we also want to make sure that we uh, catch these errors and display something to the user. So when we catch our errors that happen, we can say set error message. And in terms of the error message that we want to display to the user, we probably want to display something generic, like there was a problem loading your movie ratings. Please try again later. Or I guess we could just say, please try again. And we're displaying something generic here because if we were to just give them the error that we're getting from our JavaScript, you know, a regular user is not going to understand a stack trace or understand the technical language from the error. So you just want to display something friendly to the user that's as helpful as possible. And then into the console, we can log the error. And remember that users don't um, browse the internet with the console window open typically. And so uh, what's going to happen is that an error will show up here on the page and then us as developers, if we found a page that had an error, we can always open up the console to see that error in detail. Okay, so we've got our generic error message and then we, um, let me change this to a console.error, um, which has a little bit better formatting in the console for errors. So let's see something working here. We are uh, we have this placeholder in our unordered list that say it says movies go here and we have through our flow here either an error message or movies filled in by the time this is done. Um, so our movies, how about down here? We can say movies dot length movies go here. So we're just going to read from our data how big that array is and say like, you know, 10 movies go here or zero movies go here if nothing is loaded. So if we refresh it and watch it, you know, it's starting at zero movies and then seven movies after it's finished loading. And if I go to my network tab and 
um, slow down my network slightly, we can see that happening a little bit more clearly. So loading and then seven movies. Um, so let's go back to online. And then it also would be good for us to test this error flow to make sure that this is working. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can generate Firebase errors. So for instance, if I went to my um, Firebase page and I changed my rules, which we configured, we, we set it up in test mode so that any um, client could read and write to the database, uh, which allowed us to you know, get up and running quickly. So if we wanted, we could turn off this and set up our rules so that no one can write to it. And then our, our um, get request would fail. But another way that we can test out our flow here is we can throw our own errors. So the, the throw command, you can pass into it a string or a new error instance in this syntax where you put the message in uh, between the parentheses. And what this does is when we get to this line of code, an error is thrown and we end up catching it down here. So this allows us to kind of short circuit our logic to watch what would happen if an error came from um, our Firebase logic. If we go back to our React application, it loads for a second, and then our error pops up. And we can see it's that generic error message. There was a problem loading your movie ratings. Please try again. And then in our console, we can actually see that error printing out. And it also tells us, you know, what is the stack trace? So it came from get all movies, and it's movie listing uh, line 29. And if I expand it, I can see all the sort of uh, rest of the stack trace that led us to this function executing. So again, th this, is, this stuff in the console is not something the user is going to see. They're going to see the generic message. We're also putting things in the console in addition to putting them on the page so that we as developers, when we're working on our site, can actually see what went wrong specifically. So let's flip back. And I'm going to comment this out so that we don't have it. But I'll make a note that this is so that we can test our error flow. And what we can do from here is now that we know that the loading is working and our error message is working, we could actually start using our data in our unordered list and putting movies on the page. So instead of looping over them and printing out this information here, we're going to do that down here in a map um, statement or a map expression. So let me get rid of this. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to get rid of this console log. And inside of our UL, I will delete what is passed in, give myself a new line, give myself opening and closing curly brackets so that I can put some JavaScript in here. And then what I'm going to say is, uh, whoops, the state variable that we created is called movies, and that's an array. So I can say movies dot map, and then each element is going to be that movie data that we got back from our API, from the Firestore API. So I could say movie doc and give myself uh, curly brackets so that I am now inside of the body of this arrow function. So this arrow function needs to return some list items. So let, let me just say like dummy here. So what we should see with this version is that we got an unordered list and it puts on to the page a placeholder list element for all of the movies that should be there. And what we can start doing is pulling out that information from our doc. So as you're working, make sure you have the API documents open and you, you know which piece of the Firebase API you're, or the Firestore API you're dealing with at any moment. So what we saw was that we had a document snapshot. And um, if you're working in VS Code, sometimes it will give you uh, the actual thing that you're dealing with if you hover over it. If it's able to sort of parse your code and figure it out, sometimes you won't get this depending on your sort of coding style. Um, here we're getting it. So it's telling us that 
snapshot is a query snapshot and the docs property here is an array of query document query document snapshots so i want to pull up my documentation and i still have the query document snapshot open from last time but we can see it has an id exists it also gives us a ref and has the data method which returns all of the fields in the document as an object so we're going to want that id the unique identifier for the document we'll be able to use that as our key um, on our list elements and then we also want that data so that we can you know pull out the title and rating and release here so we will get the id from movie doc dot id and we'll get the data from movie doc dot data and the way that we know that this um, is not a function that needs to be called and this is a function is whether it is listed under the method section which data is or the properties section which id is so properties are just pieces of data that live inside of an object and methods are functions that live inside of an object okay so we've got our id which we can pass in here for our key and then instead of saying dummy let let us grab the data dot title so we're going to grab the movie title and you know why not let's also put the id on there so we will say the id is um this title and actually it's going to complain at me if i do that so i'm just going to use a dash here So we can see here are all of our IDs printing out for those movies and then the title of the movie is printing out next to it. So this is great. This just means that now to move forward, what we want to do is pull out each of these fields, the title, the release here, and the rating, and actually format them and put them on the page. And to save us a little bit of time, ahead of time in the starter files, I have given you this movie component. So this movie component, um, it has our BEM styling, it has a, sp a spot for the title, the rating, the release year, it has um, an error message that we'll talk about when we get to deleting things, it has a button for deleting things, and it has a button for editing um, the movie. So we're going to use this, and we are going to pipe into it our ID and our data as properties. So this component is expecting that props um, variable to be filled with a field called data and a field called ID. So to get started here, let's just get our movie component on the page. So if we go back to movie listing, instead of this list item with this text inside of it, what I wanna do is bring in the movie component. So I need to make sure that I import that movie component. So I'm importing movie from movie. And then if I fly down here inside of my list item, I can use that movie component and I'm going to create a self closing movie element. And we have to make sure that we supply those properties that it's expecting. So it's expecting that there's an ID property that is filled with a value and it's we're filling it in with moviedoc.id and it's also expecting that there is a data um, property that is filled in with an object that has all of the data from the movie doc so passing that in here and if we run it we should see placeholders so we, we have to like hook up some of the logic to make sure that the information displays for our movies but we have our delete and edit buttons that um, are already configured and we've got our card styling here that's already configured from that uh, movie component. And one thing that I wanna point out is that this ID and this data, these names are determined by inside of our movie component, um, this line. So this line is expressing that the props should have a property called ID and a property called data. 
And if I go back to movie listing, what we pass in is a specific value here for those properties. So this does not have to be called ID. I could call this movie ID. I just renamed it in Visual Studio Code by hitting F2 and I could call this movie data. Um, so the, the important thing is that this name on the left side equals what the property, uh, how we're using the props inside a movie. And then on the right hand side, we have to pass in a specific value. So it just happened that I called them ID and movie and data to begin with. So it was like ID equals ID and data equals data. But um, I'm going to leave it as this renamed version because this is a little bit more explicit to help folks make uh, realize the difference between the property name and the property value. Okay, so we've got our data being passed into our movie. So we could actually leave this page behind. I'm gonna save this and go back into my movie component here. So to test that this is working, I could just like try putting the ID on the page. So opening curly brackets and then just dropping the ID prop in there. So we can see each of these is loading. Um, that ID that's coming from our database here. So each document has its unique identifier inside the collection. That's what we're seeing. Let's get rid of that. So we know that this is working. So then um, this data that was passed in um, looks like I have already included the destructuring here, which is we're taking that data object and it is going to have these keys rating, release here, title, um, in camel case. So we can destructure those and pull them out into local variables. So as long as I type in title and it matches the spelling and casing from our database, it will work. But if I put in capital T, this won't work. Okay, so this is object destructuring. We've got each of these and I can pass them in so I'm going to put the title into the div that has a class name of movie title. I will put the rating into the div of class name movie rating and the year in here. So let's say release year. Check it out. We can see alien and then four and then 1979 before sunrise five, 1955 or 1995. And to maybe make this a little bit more visual, instead of displaying the number, I kind of want to display uh, hearts here. So we could go grab an icon for hearts or an image for hearts and, and display those on here. I'm just going to use emoji. So if I had a rating of three, then I might try and I'm just pulling up my Emoji keyboard on Windows, which is Windows and then the period key um, and looking through and I can see, okay, I've got a heart that's purple and I've got a heart that is white. So maybe I would, you know, if I had three, I want three hearts and then um, two white hearts here. And if you don't have an emoji keyboard on your operating system or you're not familiar with it, you can just Google search emoji and copy and paste. So here, you know, now they're all displaying three. So what I want to do is use the rating number to set up how many hearts there should be. And there's an easy way for me to do that. So I'm going to create a, whoops, const rating string. And if you have a string, put a heart in here, and then you call dot repeat on it, you can pass in a number and that is going to take what you have given it that's already in that string and repeat it and give you back a new string. So if I said repeat three times and use this rating string down here, all of them should have three purple hearts and nothing else. So if I repeat by rating, we should see hearts that match whatever the rating is. And then to get the, um, white hearts I'm gonna grab my white heart emoji and then I want to repeat this five minus the rating 
So if our rating is one purple heart, this repeats once, and then this repeats five minus one, which would be four times. So we would have one purple heart, um, and then five white hearts, or uh, four white hearts. If our rating was instead five, then this would be five minus five, or zero times, so there would be no white hearts showing up. So if we check this out in our page, we should see all of this working. So color out of space is the sample data that is one out of five. And then before sunrise is the sample data that is five out of five. And they both seem to be working. And with that, we have finished up the read part of CRUD. Um, so if we go back to our whiteboard, our kind of roadmap was learning how to create, read, update, and delete from our database. And we have done the read part where we had a collection reference and we called dot get. And that gave us everything that was in that collection. And we learned that we could use the effect hook here to schedule something to run conditionally only when the component mounts. So the way that we ran this, we set up our uh, fetch operation inside of an async function here and call it inside of our effect and use an empty array of dependencies here to say that this effect should only run when our component is mounted, when it's put it on the page. So our logic inside of here is all Firebase and the use effect is how we are kind of stitching this together into our React so that this Firebase logic runs at the right time in our lifecycle. So I'm gonna leave this video here. We will pick up in the next video diving into more of these CRUD operations. And um, we will, I'll, I'll just throw it out there, that at a certain point, we're going to come back to this effect and we are going to change it so that instead of just fetching once, um, it is constantly notified about every time something changes in our uh, database.